Welcome everyone to our monthly seminar on spirituality and health. And today we have Dr. Francis Liu, um, who is uh, the Luke and Grace Kim Professor in Cultural Psychiatry Emeritus from the University of California, Davis. Dr. Liu has contributed to the areas of cultural psychiatry, including the interface with religion, spirituality, psychiatric education, diversity, inclusion, health equity, and psychiatry and film. Maybe he'll talk to us a little bit about his film experience. The American Psychiatric Association has awarded him the Special Presidential Commem Commem Commendations in both 2002 and 2016 for his contributions to cultural psychiatry. And in 2020, they gave him the Distinguished Service Award. In 2020, the Society for the Study of Psychiatry and Culture awarded him the Lifetime Achievement Award. He successfully proposed um, with two others, including the diagnostic category of religious or spiritual problem in the DSM-4 to help with differential diagnosis of distressing experiences involving religion or psychiatry. Since 1987, he has led or co-led 37 film seminars at the Esalon Institute at Big Sur, California on positive psychological qualities and character virtues. 28 with brother David Steindl Rast, a Benedictine monk. So Dr. Liu is going to talk to us today on where do religion and spirituality appear in the DSM-5 TR. Francis, take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Harold, for your kind invitation. And my recording and PowerPoints will be on the website at the, uh, at the uh, conclusion here. And I'll put in the chat my email address uh, if you have any other questions after the talk that you'd like to be in touch with me about. I'm going to share my screen. Um, we will have about uh, 10, uh, 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. So the DSM-5 uh, TR, standing for text revision, came out in March of 2022, and it builds on the DSM-5, which came out in 2013. Um, I have no disclosures. Uh, there's my email address, which I'll type in the chat later. Um, I'm going to be speaking under the umbrella term of cultural and social structural issues in which I include religion and spirituality as one of those issues. Um, in, in there is in uh, section one is the introduction to the DSM. Uh, section two is the bulk of the DSM where we find our diagnostic criteria and codes and narrative descriptions of the mental disorders. And then in section three, we have uh, this, uh, we have the outline for cultural formulation and cultural formulation interview in which religion and spirituality is embedded. And I want to uh, pinpoint where these actually occur. My hope is that you'll be able to use these two tools in your clinical work and in your teaching um, around cultural and social structural issues in general, but about religion and spirituality in specific. So what's in yellow was added in the TR and what's underlined are the take home points. So uh, here we have a very important uh, addition that what was in the DSM-5 as cultural issues has now been expanded to cultural and social structural issues, bringing these concepts together. And I will point out very specifically uh, how that happens. 
Then we have a section entitled the cultural concepts of distress, which is a very important uh, terminology in cultural psychiatry and the three subtypes uh, which are defined in this section. Uh, idioms of distress are like the presenting complaints, if you will, and then the cause or explanatory model that the patient might have. This goes back to the work of Arthur Kleinman in 1979. And then cultural syndrome, which is a clustering of idioms and causes and other features. Then a very important new section that was entirely added the impact of racism and discrimination on psychiatric diagnosis, how this was attended to in the TR, and then sex and was added to gender differences. So in that new section, we have these uh, statements. Uh, these are quotations. So the idea of race as a social, not a biological construct, and that we have this idea of racialized identities that are important because they're associated with systems of discrimination, marginalization, and social exclusion. Now, for, they go on further to say that this extends beyond race and ethnicity to include gender, language, and religion, which I have highlighted here. Uh, th this is all new language. It should all be in yellow. But um, I highlighted here religion for the purposes of our discussion today, that we need to understand this. Now, of course, things like the Tree of Life shooting, the anti-Semitism that's been rising in our country, um, uh, th this needs to be brought up as a, um, in our minds, as a, as a clinical issue. And that racism and discrimination, I would say, exists at different levels. Uh, this is uh, described very well in this section. And that racism and discrimination is an important social determinant of health. And I'll come back to this uh, again more specifically in just a few moments. But the take home point here is that clinicians should make active efforts to recognize and address all forms of racism, bias, and stereotyping in their assessment, diagnosis, and treatment. Uh, it should have included discrimination as well there. Now, in that section two, uh, there are narrative descriptions of the mental disorders uh, in addition to the actual diagnostic criteria. And for some of the disorders, we have culture-related diagnostic issue sections and sex and gender-related diagnostic issue sections. And then in the back of this uh, section two, we have these Z codes, the other conditions that may be a focus of clinical attention. These were the V codes in uh, DSM-4 and 5. Now, um, it's called text revision because three quarters of the text has been revised, including updated references and so on, including those two sections that I have highlighted here. And in those sections, in those culture-related diagnostic uh, feature sections, you'll see uh, variations in symptom expressions and causality and cultural norms that may affect the level of perceived pathology, attention to the risk of misdiagnosis when evaluating in individuals. So the misdiagnosis of schizophrenia uh, in African-Americans, for example. Now, if you turn to the index of DSM-5-TR and just look under religion, you will find these diagnoses listed. Now, in checking these uh, references, it, they reference back to those culture-related diagnostic issue sections. So, um, you know, if you, um, and I'll give you some examples in a moment. So here, are uh, specific uh, references to religion in those culture-related diagnostic issue sections. I imagine there are more, but uh, this is what is actually in the index. Um, now, 
in the section around uh, psycho psychotic disorders, there's a kind of an overview description. And here we find these page numbers refer to the TR. Uh, statements such as this, that some religious and supernatural beliefs may be viewed as bizarre and delusional in some cultural contexts, but may be generally acceptable in others, and that hallucinations may be a normal part of religious experience in certain cultural contexts. So the idea here is to bring to the awareness of the clinician that before you call an idea or a belief as delusional, which is a psychotic symptom, or a, um, a uh, hearing voices, before you call that a hallucination and a psychotic symptom, um, before you do that, before you go down the psychopathology track, you really need to think about the cultural context to, to evaluate, to assess, uh, to what extent is this psychopathological and to what is this extent, is it cultural or religious or spiritual? That is a very, very important differential diagnosis that um, we, we need to, to do at the phenomenological level. Uh, and then similarly, if you go to the index and look under spirituality, you will find these specific disorders which uh, um, have reference to spirituality in those culture-related diagnostic issues sections. Now, turning to the Z codes, uh, this is the introduction to the Z codes, that these are conditions or psychosocial or environmental problems that may affect the diagnosis, course, prognosis, treatment of an individual's mental disorders. These are now called Z codes to align with ICD-10. And then why should we uh, code these or why should we consider this as part of the diagnosis? Well, added in the TR at the bottom there in yellow are very important reasons that if it plays a role in the initiation or exacerbation of a mental disorder, or if it constitutes a problem that should be on the treatment plan. But it's important to remember that conditions in this section are not mental disorders. They are not mental disorders, and that's why they tend to be forgotten, because of our job as psychiatrists and mental health professionals is to diagnose and treat mental disorders, and these are not mental disorders. Well, there may be a tendency to just say, well, who cares? But the reality is now, uh, I think, a much greater awareness that these link into the social determinants of mental health, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Now, these are the categories of these conditions. And under each of these categories, and I'll give you a couple of examples in a moment, there are uh, specific codes for, you know, for specific things. So for example, under housing problem, you will find housing insecurity, which is a very well-known um, social determinant of mental health. And I'll give you more examples in a moment. Now, suicidal behavior and non-suicidal self-injury was added here. Um, that's not a social determinant of mental health. Uh, I think that was added because of, you know, how, uh, how prevalent and important that is. And here are other categories. And again, under each category, there are specific codes. Now, this next slide is from Michael Compton and Ruth Shim from 2019. And in the center here, you'll see 16 social determinants of mental health. Now, the 10 in yellow were ones that they included in their 2015 book with that title. Um, and the six in white are new ones uh, they, they added since, uh, since that time. So if you look in the lower uh, left corner, we have adverse early life experiences, which are the ACEs, A-C-E-S, a very well-known social determinant of mental health. And just to the right of it, do you see discrimination and social exclusion, social isolation? So that ties in with that whole section that I just mentioned earlier about uh, racism, discrimination as a social determinant of mental health. And then uh, just looking uh, above it, we see things like homelessness, food insecurity, and things like that, 
that again are well known social determinants of mental health. And in the upper right corner, we have climate change. So these 16 social determinants of mental health have an adverse health and mental health outcome through those intermediary factors looking north. Now, upstream from these uh, social determinants of mental health, what underlies them are the public policies and social norms um, uh, that can affect these social determinants of mental health. So, uh, for example, in 2021, uh, Congress passed uh, the child uh, tax credit, which cut childhood poverty by 50%. So you see that public policy led to an incredible impact on that social determinant of mental health, as just as an example. So the, AP, the APA, the API Press, has actually uh, published a trilogy, if you will, uh, starting with the uh, 2015 book and then uh, a 2020 book on the concept of social injustice. And then finally, uh, this one on um, seven federal uh, legislative policies um, that have impacted the social determinants of mental health. Now in that category of problems related to the social environment, there are some specific ones that I think are related to religion and spirituality. So for example, we have this one, this is an exact quote, this existed in the five and unchanged with the TR, um, bullying, teasing and intimidation by others, being targeted by others for verbal abuse and humiliation. And then we have this one um, of target of perceived adverse discrimination or persecution. And as you can see in the last sentence there, that's broadly defined, including religion, including religion. And again, I, I, I you know, this has become an increasing problem in our country, as I'm sure all of you are well aware of. Now, finally, this is the last one I wanted to mention, which uh, came into the DSM-4 uh, through the efforts of myself and David Lukoff and Robert Turner, um, that this is a, a category of distressing experiences involving religion or spirituality. And examples are loss or questioning of faith, problems associated with conversion to a new faith, or questioning of other spiritual values. Uh, so, for example, someone who has a mystical experience or a near-death experience and then are distressed by it um, and comes in to see a clinician. Uh, so before we say, well, this person, you know, is delusional or is hallucinating, before we go down the psychopathology track, we, we need to think about this category as a possibility. And it's not an either or, you know, someone could have a, a, a mental disorder like a major depression and a religious or spiritual problem. So for example, the clinician asks, well, what brings you here today? And the patient says, well, you know, I've lost my faith in God and God is punishing for my sins. And that is what's primary on the person's mind. Well, we may want to consider this as part of the diagnosis along with any mental disorder, you know, you do the further review and you find out the person meets criteria for your major depression, uh, of course, you would diagnose that mental disorder. But in addition, you can include religious or spiritual problem. And of course, uh, Ken Pargament and uh, Julie Exxon has, has written extensively about this culminating in their 2022 book, on spiritual struggles, uh, and they outlined uh, six kinds of struggles, you know, divine struggles, struggles with doubt, interpersonal struggles. I believe they gave a, a talk, or uh, Ken did give a talk uh, within the past year on this, and then also demonic struggles and struggles of ultimate meaning and, and moral struggles. Um, as just some examples of, of spiritual struggles. And so um, 
the three of us had written articles on this, starting with the 1992 Journal of Nervous and Mental Disease. We felt that this idea would improve diagnostic assessment and reduce the iatrogenic harm from misdiagnosis of these uh, problems, uh, where someone would call um, uh, a dis this kind of distressing experience, again, examples of psychopathology of a mental disorder, uh, which we would think would, uh, would, would be detrimental to the patient, and hoping that this would improve treatment and em encourage uh, clinical training in this area. Now, moving on to section three, we have, uh, again, our, our two tools, the Outline for Cultural Formulation, uh, which is abbreviated OCF here, which originated uh, in DSM-4, but was buried in Appendix I, the ninth appendix. It was revised for the five and revised for the TR. Then we have the cultural formulation interview or the CFI, new in the five, unchanged in the TR. And we have a section now called the cultural concepts of distress, which now has 10 examples and instead of nine examples. So here is the outline. And this is meant when you, when you say, well, what are the cultural issues in this case? You know, sometimes the, the eyes kind of glaze over, like, what do you mean the cultural issues? Well, here's an outline to help you understand what those might be. And so the, the, these are questions that we, or issues that we ask the clinicians to gather. So what's the cultural identity of the individual? What are the cultural concepts of distress? Um, what are the cultural stressors and supports in the person's life? What are the cultural features of the relationship between the individual and the clinician? Right there in the room and added in the TR was treatment team and institution. And then finally, the last part there is it asks us to summarize this information and what is its impact for the differential diagnosis of mental disorders and the v co and the Z codes, and then what's the treatment plan implications? And I'm going to go over this in greater detail in just a moment. Now, for the uh, for the DSM-5, uh, the work group on cultural issues led by Roberto Luis Fernandez at Columbia, uh, and I was part of that 30-person work group we felt it would be very helpful to give the clinician um, questions um, so that, that they can ask to obtain the information for the outline, because the outline was not very operational, if you will. So what was devised was a core CFI of 16 questions for the patient and then 17 questions for the informants. They're basically the same questions with one added question. Now, in addition to the core CFI, which is published in the, uh, in the back of the uh, TR, there are 12 supplementary modules, which are not in the, not in the published uh, TR, but rather you access it through the website listed there. And in there is one supplementary module in the yellow on religion, spirituality, and moral traditions. So this is a supplementary module that you need to get a hold of. Um, and I'll review briefly what's contained in that module in a moment. And, and so these are basically deeper dives for uh, for more exploration. So there are three questions on cultural identity in the core CFI. If you wanna ask more questions, uh, then you pick out that supplementary module on cultural identity and you'll find uh, 25 additional questions. And then the last four in the right-hand column are concerning patient populations where we felt you know, some additional attention needed to be paid. Uh, so if you're working with, you know, children or older adults or immigrants and refugees um, or people um, 
with religious or spiritual moral tradition issues that come up, these supplementary modules uh, may be helpful in understanding the, these cultural issues. So this is what it looks like in the TR itself. Uh, as you can see, it's not simply a list of 16 questions, but in the left-hand column, there's a guide to the interviewer. In the right, we have a specific language that you can use. And the first question you can see in the center there is what brings you here today? So hopefully you're asking that question right now. You're already doing one of 16. So now I'm gonna go over the 16 questions and relate them back to the outline. They're not in the same order. Uh, because uh, we felt what brings you here today would be the natural place to start rather than asking, well, what is most important about your background or cultural identity? So what brings you here today? The person might say soul loss. Uh, so you would say sometimes people have different ways of describing their problem to their social network. How would you describe your soul loss to them? So wherever you see problem in caps and brackets, we'd like you to use the patient's words whenever possible. So what troubles you most about your soul loss? And then the next two questions are about causes. Why do you think this is happening to you? And what do you think are the causes of your soul loss? And what do others in your social network say are the causes of your soul loss? Now, this relates to part B of the outline. This is the exact language in the TR. You'll find this exactly in that section three. Again, what's underlined are the take-home points and what's uh, in yellow is new in the TR. As you can see, the three subtypes uh, defined in section one are listed here, and that the severity, level of severity and meaning of these distressing experiences should be assessed in relation to the norms of the individual's cultural background. That's why we have those two questions involving the, the uh, social network. And then the last sentence here is very important. This is the assessment of coping and help-seeking patterns should consider the use of professional as well as traditional alternative or complementary sources of care. So we're interested here not only in the visits to the social worker or the psychologist or the psychiatrist, but also uh, Tai Chi and acupuncture and religious or spiritual healers. Um, and the questions uh, related to this part of the outline come later in the CFI. They're questions 11 to 15. So we'll come back to this in a moment. Um, now, as I mentioned, in section three, there's a whole section, a subsection on cultural concepts of distress where you could learn more about what this term means. And there are 10 examples described. Uh, Hikikomori was the new one that was added in the TR. So you'll see here's a, a little table in the far uh, left. We find the actual name of the concept. So susto um, is described, there's a, there's a, a, a description of, of this uh, concept and soul loss is actually, uh, uh, to, helps to describe uh, susto. And in the center column, which of the three subtypes? So like nervios is an idiom of distress, but at the same time, it is part of the cultural syndrome of atake de nervios. And then in the far uh, right column are places in the world where we see this, um, at least where it was reported and so on. But of course, with, uh, you know, with migration, uh, we see this, you know, throughout the world, these, these concepts. Now, this a book is a cautionary tale um, based on a true life story of a Hmong family, Hmong being an ethnic group from Laos, uh, in the Central Valley of California. And um, a neurologist and pediatrician um, had a biomedical explanation for this infant's uh, grand mal uh, seizure disorder, uh, and of course, a biomedical treatment of medications. However, the family called it the spirit catches you and you fall down. And they had 
um, you know, a, a supernatural cause to the uh, presenting complaint. And they had a supernatural treatment of using shamans. Um, and uh, unfortunately, there was never uh, appreciation of this difference in cultural concepts of distress. And um, and unfortunately, it led to noncompliance with the medication, and the child lapsed into a vegetative state after a prolonged grand mal seizure that lasted 11 years before, for the, before the person died. Um, so it just points out the importance of understanding the cultural concepts of distress of the patient and the family, and what are the similarities and differences with our cultural concepts of the distress. Now, moving on to the next two questions, we have, are there any kinds of support that make your soul loss better, such as support from family, friends, or others? And are there any kinds of stresses that make your soul loss worse? such as difficulties with money or family problems. So these two questions relate to part C, the cultural stressors and supports. Uh, so the first sentence summarizes this section. Identify the key stressors and supports in the individual social environment, which may include both local and distant events. Now this next sentence was added and this is really critical. It, it says, these include the social determinants of the individual's mental health. And as you can see, the ones listed there, they align with those Z codes that I talked about earlier, the 16 social determinants of mental health, including exposure to racism and discrimination and so on that again, I talked about earlier that relate to uh, religion and spirituality amongst other factors. And then the next sentence says, also assess the role of religion, family, and other social networks that can cause stress or provide support. Now, religion and family were specifically noted going all the way back to DSM-4, uh, the outline for cultural formulation at that point. It was kept over here for the five and uh, social networks was added in the five. And then uh, for the TR, the additional uh, points there were added there that obviously uh, these uh, domains, if you will, religion, family, social networks could either cause stress or provide support. And we need to ass assess that. So just expanding on this a little bit, uh, again, we can look at the interpersonal relationships across those three domains as an example of local environmental factors that are happening here and now. But then we need to look at the social determinants of mental health, again, local by geography or time or distant by geography or time. So what do I mean by that? Well, take um, anti-Semitism. Well, you know, that's 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 local, you know, like we had the Tree of Life shooting uh, recently and other anti-Semitic attacks. Uh, you know, that's happening now. You know, that's happening here and now. But it's also distant because we know that anti-Semitism goes back centuries, you know, all throughout the world, practically. I mean, um, and so... Um, or climate change. Well, that's happening here and now with the storms and the hurricanes and the uh, and the global warming and all of that. But it's also distant because it's affecting the whole earth. And it goes back to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So turning to that supplementary module on religion, spirituality, and moral traditions, here are the four categories of the 19 questions that are in this module. So they're questions about uh, probing for the religious, spiritual, or moral identity. Also, the roles in everyday life. 
uh, and this is looking at individual practices as well with family and faith leaders and faith communities. We we want to to know this or understand this uh, to understand you know what role that's playing in the person's life for either for stress or support, and then. What's the relationship of all of this to the presenting problem that the person is coming with, coming in with? Uh, that that that's a that's an orienting feature of this uh, cultural formulation interview. Is we're trying to relate uh, the person's cultural uh, background and so on to the problem. So how do these practices, ritual ceremonies help with coping with the problem? And then what are potential stresses or conflicts related to the person's cultural identity? Um, so I'll come back to that in a moment. And then in family, of course, uh, you know, there uh, we need to think about uh, how Religion or spirituality may be one of those family characteristics that would help us understand the family. And um, Pamela Hayes, in a, in a book uh, that's referenced in a moment, uh, talks about uh, cultural strengths and supports. And we have things here like religious faith or spirituality um, or uh, cult religious communities here. Um, and then uh, space for prayer and meditation as examples. Um, and so here are uh, some of the uh, books here, Pamela Hayes. Um, yeah, Pamela Hayes's book on uh, addressing cultural complexities in clinical practice. Um, so coming now to the next three questions are on cultural identity. For you, what are the most important aspects of your background or identity? Are there any aspects of your background or identity that make a difference to your soul loss? And are there any other aspects of your background identity that are causing other concerns or difficulties for you? It's like a second pass question. So this relates to the uh, cultural identity part A. This is what we see in the four. Uh, again, uh, references to race, ethnicity, and biculturality and language. Now, added in the five was this very important sentence, which expanded explicitly the cultural identity variables to be considered, including religious affiliation for the first time. And then for the TR, this was further expanded. So you can see there, um, uh, again, it's just a listing of cultural identity variables that we should consider. And added here is not only religious affiliation, which existed previously, but and spirituality that was explicitly added. Uh, and then other ones that are added. And then at the end of that sentence, among others. So this is not an exclusive list. So for example, veteran status or disability status might be uh, cultural identity variables that certain persons identify with uh, that, uh, uh, that are not listed here. So, um, and then a very important sentence, note which aspects of identity are prioritized by the individual and how they interact, intersectionality. So we can never tell someone's cultural identity just by looking at them. We need to ask. It's ask, don't assume. That's really part of cultural humility. Ask, don't assume. And then how they intersect. So. Um, and uh, the rest of this is the same as the T as the DSM-5. It talks about biculturality and language. So just to give you some schemas to help you understand this, we have the addressing framework in which the word addressing is an acronym for cultural identity variables that we need to think about, including you see religion and spirituality there. Uh, but it's not it's not complete because in the right there we see language in brackets. Uh, there's no L in addressing, yet that's a very important cultural identity variable. This is Pamela Hayes again. And here's another schema where we see at eight o'clock linguistic characteristics going clockwise to spirituality at five o'clock. These are different cultural identity variables and we see how they intersect. Uh, to help us understand the cultural identity. And in this diagram, we have at six o'clock health beliefs and practices, which is 
a part uh, a part uh, a B and environment, which is part C. Yeah, so cultural identity is central. It relates to all of the other sections. And um, yes, yeah, so that issue about cultural identity being potential source of stress or support. So someone might be having an, an intrapsychic cultural identity conflict about what's one's religious or uh, identity, for example, you know, they may have been a very committedly religious person early in life, but are drifting away. They may have conflicts about that, or someone might be changing denominations. Uh, the, all kinds of issues uh, that people are grappling with might be important for us to understand. And, uh, and then also interpersonal relationship conflicts uh, between the parents that may be very religiously committed and the adolescents who are drifting away, you know, they have different cultural identities and different values and they may have conflicts related there. That's what we need to understand the cultural identity of, of, of people that, and families that we're working with. And certainly at the social level, we see, see this. Uh, I am aware of the time. So next we have questions 11 to 15, which go back to the issues around self-coping and past help seeking and barriers to care. And then a very important question is number 14. What kinds of help do you think would be most useful to you at this time for your soul loss? And are there any other kinds of help that your social network would suggest? So this all relates back to that part B that I mentioned earlier about coping and help seeking patterns. And of course, there can be a whole range of possibilities uh, and just pictures and the lists of different approaches that people might be using. Now, the last question is actually a very, very important question. Um, sometimes doctors and patients misunderstand each other because they come from different uh, backgrounds or have different expectations. Have you been concerned about this? And is there anything we can do to provide you with the care that you need? So this just touches on the clinician-patient relationship. And this is part D. I know this is a busy slide, but again, the first sentence says it all. Identify the differences in the cultural identity um, between the individual and the clinician that may cause difficulties in communication and may influence diagnosis and treatment. Um, again, in yellow was added, and this was all retained from the five. Experiences of racism and discrimination in the larger society may impede trust and problems that can come up are misunderstanding what's cultural and what's what's psychopathological and ultimately may impact on the therapeutic alliance, which we know is so important in our work with patients. Now, how do you operationalize this? Let me give you four steps and, and some examples. So the first step is that the clinician really needs to understand their own cultural identity through self-reflection, understanding um, also one's biases and limitations of knowledge and skills, uh, uh, rather than assuming that you, you know, know, know everything here. The second is to compare the cultural identity of the patient to that of the clinician. So, if you will, you can draw a little table uh, where the left-hand column are the cultural identity variables like age, gender, uh, race, ethnicity, religious, spiritual orientation. Uh, in the center, you put the, the uh, patient's uh, cultural identity variables. And in the far right column, you put the clinicians and uh, cultural identity variables. Look at similarities and differences and how that might affect things. And I'll give you some examples in just a moment. And then the third step is to assess the impact of those similarities and differences on the relationship. And these are variables or things that we think about every day with every patient. So the idea is put on this cultural lens to see if we could see more that may be affecting our relationship with our patient. 
And then the last, and here, uh, obviously, one thing that we are very concerned about is bias, uh, which could be either implicit, uh, either explicit or implicit bias across different variables. Uh, and this could go both ways, the clinician bias towards the patient or the patient bias against the clinician. And of course, religion and spirituality is one of these biases, which, uh, you know, are our professions of psychiatry and psychology, you know, has changed over the years, but, you know, had a, had an inherent bias and that homosexuality was a mental disorder until 1973. Um, and the fourth step, the final step, the key step, what would help the clinician to provide optimal care? So sometimes a cultural identity match is very important. I'll give you some examples in a moment. Other times it's increasing your knowledge and skills concerning these various areas. So, okay, so here are some examples. I, uh, my parents came from China in the late forties. I was born in San Francisco, but I only speak English. And a Chinese patient comes up to me on an inpatient unit and starts speaking Cantonese. Well, we have a language difference, and this is obviously causing a problem in communication. So I need to understand that. I need to respond by getting a trained interpreter or working through a Cantonese-speaking clinician or referring the patient to a Cantonese-speaking psychiatrist. That's where a cultural identity match might make a very big difference in the assessment and treatment process. Second case, I'm a man and a woman comes into an outpatient clinic for initial interview, is very quiet, doesn't say very much, and at the end says, well, you know, I'd rather speak to a woman psychiatrist. So what do I do with that? Do I say passive aggressive, you know, treatment resistant? Do I go down that psychopathology track? Or do I ask and not assume, you know, okay, tell me more. And the patient says, well, you know, I've had a tough time with my husband. I don't want to get into it. And we later find out there's a sexual abuse history and the patient has, has difficulty trusting men. So there again, a cultural identity match between a woman a psychiatrist and a, and a woman a patient might make a big difference. Third example is I'm a Biden Democrat and a and a man walks in with a red cap that says, make America great again. And he says, well, what country are you from? So here we have a political orientation difference and bias is coming up immediately that's affecting our relationship. I need to understand the larger picture here rather than taking it personally. The last example um, is I'm an atheist. And I asked the patient, well, what brings you here today? And the patient says, well, you know, God is punishing me for my sins and, and I've lost my faith in God. So here we have a, a, a difference there. And that could cause problems if I stay silent. Um, you know, I wasn't trained in, in talking about these things and I don't believe in God anyway, and I should just stay silent. Uh, but the patient may feel neglected and drop out of treatment. Or worse yet, I might say, well, what? why is God so important to you? You know, in, implying there's some psychopathology related to this. Again, the patient may feel disrespected and drop out of treatment. And here again, you know, uh, as we know, some patients request a, a Christian uh, therapist and you know, upon further assessment, maybe that would make a lot of sense. That cultural identity match may be quite important to the treatment. I am aware of the time here and I will move on. The last section is it asks us to summarize how all of this impacts on our differential diagnosis of mental disorders, other clinically relevant issues or problems. Those are the Z codes and then impact on the treatment. And so, Again, uh, we know that misdiagnosis can lead to mistreatment, um, and uh, this could be related to all of the things that we've talked about today. And so, uh, you know, uh, ways to deal with this is to review those culture-related, sex and gender-related diagnostic issues sections to help us with the differential diagnosis, review and add the Z codes so they can be addressed in the treatment plan, so if, if, if you have religious or spiritual problem diagnosed, well, we may want to get a religious or spiritual assessment and consider religious or spiritual interventions 
for our patient. And of course, to use our two, two, two clinical tools that we've discussed. And then in the treatment planning process, there's the process of negotiating and managing a treatment plan to maximize adherence and compliance. Again, something we're interested every day with every patient. So the idea is put on the cultural lens, see if understanding these cultural issues may improve um, you know, this process. And then certainly from the content point of view, uh, because of time, I'm just going to skip through these um, and say that, um, of course, the, these are some um, references that would help you understand the outline for cultural formulation and the CFI, uh, an incredible uh, cultural formulation interview training module at Columbia and additional uh, resources. And all of this will be on the slides. So thank you very much for your attention. We have 10 minutes for Q&A. Terrific, um, Francis. What a great presentation. And I will now welcome participants to unmute themselves and ask your question. Also type them in the chat. That would be most efficient, I think, at this point. There were a couple of questions in the chat, one by Harold Cudler. Harold, could you just unmute yourself and ask it maybe? Yeah, my, my pleasure, Harold. Thank you. So, um, uh, Dr. Liu, you know, as you were speaking, and I'm going to basically read what I wrote, because I, I found myself reflecting on another dimension of the relationship between psychiatry and religious and spiritual uh, factors, and that is the rising interest in psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. Uh, and I've really been struck that a lot of psychiatrists are providing psychedelics and thinking of it very pharmacologically, uh, but they also see themselves as modeling it on uh, shamanistic uh, pro procedures in the American Southwest and uh, the Amazon base in Central America. And what's interesting is that those shamans don't see this as pharmacological at all. They consider the, the plant a spirit or even a god, or uh, they, they have an entirely different view of what they're doing and how they're achieving their output. So we've got psychiatrists putting this pharmacologic view on it. We've got the shamans that they're modeling on having an entirely different view of what's going on. And then you have the patient coming at it with their own context, religious and spiritual, as well as uh, about what science and psychiatry are. So I wonder if this is something that you've seen written about or had some thoughts about yourself. Well, that's a very, uh, very, very good question. I think it illustrates, uh, you know, again, uh, uh, cultural explanations of what's going on, you know, psychopharmacologic versus cultural. <laughs> Beautiful and uh, and and the importance of understanding uh, uh, understanding that concept for this phenomenon, uh, so that we can um, uh, so that we understand where we are coming from as well, and so that uh, we we can work with uh, the patients from different uh, cultural backgrounds. Um, you know, uh, back in 1980, I spent a month long residential uh, seminar at Esalen Institute with Stan and Christina Groff, G-R-O-F, who's really the grandfather of psychedelic therapy. He had done a lot of work in LSD and Czechoslovakia and also in Maryland before it became illegal and everything. And, um, and, uh, and it's just amazing now that in the last few years, all of, all of the uh, seeds that he planted back then have come to fruition in terms of people looking at this much more seriously. And so um, I, I do think that this is a fascinating topic and it gives us the opportunity to bring this cultural perspective uh, to uh, what's happening here and not just fall into the psychopharmacologic perspective that we tend to go with. Great. Um, Ann Berger is next. And then Joan. So thank you. That was a, that was an amazing lecture. I mean, there are actually a lot of um, parallels to um, what we see in palliative care. And even the type of questions are similar to um, Christina's FICA in terms of, um, you know, how would professionals 
Let's address this in care. Um, the um, question I had, but I'm going to also answer the psychedelic one because I've been very involved in that world, um, is about the word soul loss. It's interesting because um, that is essentially what a lot of this is. Um, in palliative care, we actually ask the questions about meaning and purpose. And I'm just wondering how many patients actually understand the word soul loss or if that needs to be explained because even meaning and purpose, many times we need to explain. Yes, I've typed in the chat my email address. If you have any okay. questions, anything I can help you with. And all of you, please Google Lou, ATP, and then Ikiru, I-K-I-R-U. And right at the top, you'll come to a PDF article is the most important article I've written in my life. And it's about a Japanese film um, by Akira Kurosawa that was recently remade uh, into a film called Living with Bill Nighley about a man who discovers his aliveness when he realizes he has six months to live. Okay. Um, it, so it's right up on there at Palliative okay. Care. I've, I've done presentations on Nikiru over Zoom. Happy to, uh, happy to do one at your institution. Okay, well, thank you. Um, now, in terms of the psilocybin or um, psychedelic type um, medication, um, something that I've actually developed is a tool called the NIH Heals, which um, measures psychosocial spiritual healing. And the three factors that are involved are connection, reflection, introspection, and trust and acceptance. That tool um, has not only been validated, but has been studied in a psilocybin study with cancer patients who have had depression and is a published article if you were interested. And I'm at NIH, so you can easily find me and I can send you the article. Um, but the, the NIH heals is now, which is a psychosocial spiritual measure. It's being um, tested a lot in psychedelic studies um, since that first study. And um, not only do we have that article, but it's been written up a lot in a whole focused um, psych psychedelic um, edition that we have like a, a, a journal through neuropharmacology. There are about six articles where we reference the yeah. NIH. Yeah. Thank you, Anne. Uh, there's an organization that you may know about, MAPS, M-A-P-S. They had a major conference in Denver uh, just last week on psychedelics. Um, there's a tremendous amount of information at MAPS. You just Google that. Um, there's the handbook of, of, of um, medical hallucinogens that Charles, uh, Charles uh, uh, Grob, G-R-O-B, edited uh, that I recommend as well. Yeah. Other, other questions in the few minutes we have left? Joan is next. Joan, go ahead. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Koning, and uh, thank you for hosting this, and thank you, Dr. Luke, for a very comprehensive and um, just very interesting presentation. I've learned a lot. As a new clinician, um, I know you were talking about the Z codes and moral struggle, and I'm just wondering how you could help me think about moral injury um, and also um, PTSD. Obviously, some of these are not diagnoses, but um, thinking about the placement and how to sort of tease them out and where they sort of fall in the DSM. Thank you very much for that question. In fact, uh, Harold and I and John Petit and uh, Jennifer, uh, Jennifer Wortham and, uh, and some others, uh, we've just in the last few months, we've had some calls about uh, the possibility of expanding that category of religious or spiritual problem um, to include religious, spiritual, or moral problems, and to include mm -hmm. their uh, moral, uh, moral doubt, moral distress, and moral injury. I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, Harold. Is that okay? That's perfectly fine. Yeah. Francis. So I this was is just that. Would. Yeah, just an idea, you know, idea stage. And there's a whole uh, process at DSM 
uh, five where, you know, for revisions, uh, ongoing revisions. And so, you know, you have to submit a proposal with references and so on and so forth. And, and so they can make that change before the DSM-6 comes out, probably in 2028 or 2030. Uh, they can make that change. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we're, we're, we're kind of working on that. And I think that that would be a way of advancing this discussion to include, um, include it. Great, thank you. That's helpful and good luck. Okay, so um, maybe we have room for one more question and then we'll have to close the seminar for today. One more question. I put in the chat that I'm happy to present at other venues uh, should you wish for me to do so. So just contact me by email. One more question, Chaplain Mike uh, Zussman. Uh, sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Liu. I really appreciate it and learned a lot from this. You indicated at one point um, the um, how the attitudes uh, within the mental health profession about religion and spirituality have have changed over time. And I would love to hear uh, any thoughts you might have on that, on that per perspective of that, where that's come and where it may be going now. Well, basically uh, for most of the last century, I think religion psychology has psychopathologized religion and spirituality. And I think beginning around 1990 with the landmark work of our dear friend, David Larson, who passed away in 2003 prematurely, uh, he led the way uh, along with Harold, of course, to uh, begin to turn the tide on all of this. And we've begun to, uh, the APA, American Psychiatric Association, American Psychological Association, I think have taken this much more seriously so that we can see religion and spirituality is not linked to psychopathology, but in fact uh, can be a source of strength and support for our patients, and that uh, it, it, it's not necessarily tied to psychopathology as a sign or symptom, but there is this possibility of religious or spiritual problem, a distressing experience that is a, not a mental disorder, and yet it needs its own assessment and treatment, be it a religious or spiritual intervention, possibly. Again, please email me if you wish to have further dialogue. I know we're out of time. Thank you very, very much for, for giving me this opportunity to share this information with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francis, for a terrific presentation, and thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you next month.